Good morning, Alive Church. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Are we feeling refreshed from such an amazing time? Praise, right? Mm -hmm. So as you know, we have our Sunday fun, fun day coming up just next week. So this is a great opportunity to invite your entire family out to church, to invite your friends and your neighbors, um, and even ask God to place somebody on your heart that you feel like you should reach out to and invite next week. Now, it is going to be a ton of fun. Princess, who is our children's director, director here, she does an incredible job. And she is going to be having a, I, I wrote down a list here, of a foam machine, an inflatable soccer field. <laughs> she is also going to be having an inflatable bouncy house. Like, she has it ready for the kids. And she's also got a scavenger hunt for the kids as well as the youth. So it is going to be an amazing time. And of course, we're also gonna be having lots of food and we're gonna be just getting to support all of those getting baptized, which is gonna be an amazing time uh, as a congregation together. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't scare me at all. <laughs> So make sure that you plug it into your calendars and come for next week. And it would also be such a big help if people would want to bring cases of water, chips, or cookies as well to help out with that event. Now, for everyone that has signed up to be baptized um, and you're all registered, we have our baptism class happening today after the service. And it's going to be happening just in our upstairs classroom right here. So now we are in our new sermon series, The Fruit of the Holy Spirit, Cultivating God's Character for Stronger Relationships. So why don't we stand together and read Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ crucify the flesh with its hands and desires. Seated. So today we look at our first fruit, which is love. What's interesting is there is a single instance in scripture when God calls us to change anyone. Yes, we are called to be an influential light in the dark world. Yes, we are exhorted to be a city on a hill. And yes, our commission is to make disciples. However, what we won't find are scriptures that say, Beloved, let us change one another. Or, a new command I give to you. As I have modified you, you should modify one another. Or, my personal favorite, fix thy neighbor. <laughs> I may have missed it somewhere in the YouVersion Bible app, but making people into what we want or think that they should be isn't found anywhere in the Holy Scriptures. However, what we do find is a clear command to love. We are to love our spouse, we're to love our children, and we are to love our siblings. We're, lo we're to love our colleagues and our classmates and our neighbors. And yes, we are even called to love our enemies. 1 John 4, 7 to 8 says, Dear friends, let us continue to love another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. God is love. This we can clearly see that love is a choice, not a feeling. Jesus even challenges his disciples in Luke 6.35 to love your enemies. Now, this doesn't mean that we resign ourselves to be a doormat. Nor does it mean that we never address an issue or set a boundary. Sometimes the most loving thing that we can do is actually set a boundary or speak the truth in love. Nevertheless, regardless of the situation, the question should never be, how can I change them? The question is, what does love look like? And the great thing is, love is a fruit of the Spirit, which means that if we submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit, produce good soil and atmosphere around us, and stay intimately connected to Jesus, God actually produces his love in us. Why don't we stand um, and pray for this morning? God, we just thank you. Heavenly Father, you are so, so good. Father, we just want to lift your name on high this morning, Father. As we come into your house, we just want to praise your holy name. Father, we are here to seek you further. God, I just pray that our, that our spiritual eyes and ears be open this morning, be receptive to the message that you have for us. 
Father, let us be good representations of Christ's love to people around us. Father, let us help lead people to Christ by your love, by the love that we show to other people, that they know that there's something different with who you are because we show Christ's love to others. Father, we just, we just pray that you help, help us cultivate this fruit, Father. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the fruit of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just thank you. We thank you for coming into this house and dwelling here with us, Father. God, we just pray that your atmosphere flows in this place, that your presence flows in this place this morning. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Alive Church, I'm going to actually keep you standing for just a moment because we can't go through the fruit of the Spirit of love without showing our love to our neighbor. So Alive Church, you know how this works. What I want you to do is I want you to find someone new and I want you to give them a Alive Church hug. I want you to go across the room and find someone that you haven't talked to and I want you to show the love of Christ to them. So go now, find somebody new, show them the love. Take it. <laughs> Thank you. Alive church, all right, all right, alive church. And we are spreading the love across our church. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Awesome. So I'm actually going to have you guys be seated now. So we, I know we did a little bit of up and down, but there are two simple things that we need to do in order to keep our love alive in the relationships that we have around us. First, we need to ask, what is love? What is love? And then the second thing that we're going to be asking is, how does love act? How do we act in a form of love? So the first thing is, is, uh, is ask what love is. So how do we do that? There are a couple popular misconceptions that we have in today's world, in today's society, based on the fact though, that we use the word love all the time. We use the word love all the time. I, I will say I love my wife. I love pepperoni pizza. I love apple pie. I love Canada. I love a live church. I love you. I love you. We use the word love all the time, but what does it actually mean? And I, and I want us to learn, okay, how do we keep the love for a lifetime? Not a moment, but how do we keep it going for a lifetime? So there's two popular misconceptions that we're going to be going through. And the two popular misconceptions is love is only a feeling. That's all there is to it. It's just a feeling. It's, it, it's a quiver in my liver, an ocean of emotion. It's, it's how I feel. I love. And so, you know, it's a great feeling. It's a very powerful feeling. Love is a very powerful feeling. And it can drive you. But love is not only a feeling. And then the ne next misconception is love is uncontrollable. So a lot of people may feel like, oh, I can't control my love. Or they'll use certain phrases like, I fell into love. And the, and the improper part of that is, is you can go, fall into the deception of, oh, I, was just, I just fell into love. One day I was just walking along and I tripped and I, you know, I fell into love with my, with my spouse. And the problem with that, the problem, misconception in that, is later on in life when you go through struggles or you go through problems, you can say, oh, I just, I just fell out of love. I just fell out of love. And there's a misconception. So how do you develop a kind of love that lasts? We have to understand what love is really about and what God says about love. God has a very different perspective on what love is. The Bible says that love is actually controllable. Jesus commanded that we love one another. He commanded that we love one another. You and I have control whether we love someone or we don't. We have the choice whether we love someone or we don't. Love is a choice, not a feeling. And what, this is what God says about it. This leads us to a couple things that God says about love. He helps us understand what it really is. And God says 
that love is a choice. In Colossians 3.14, he says, And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together. We need to circle that, highlight that, underline it. It's an act. We put it on. We put on love. We have to act in a way that is loving. God wouldn't have commanded it if it wasn't important. It's important to him. Then number two, love is a matter of conduct. It's how we act. In 1 John 3.18 it says, Let us not love with words or tongue, but actions and truth. So it's all about our actions. It's how we act. That's what love is really about. It's how I act towards another person. And you can talk until you're blue in the face, but your heart, your heart will always reveal through your actions. It will always reveal through your actions. We take these two things and we put them together and we get love is a matter of choice and love is a matter of conduct. It's a choice and it's an action. And you realize the key to this is our second point. We need to act like love acts. But the real question is, is how are we supposed to act? Who gets to tell us how we're supposed to act? Most of us probably grew up with Hollywood telling us how to act. You know, watching movies, watching TV shows, they showed us how to act, but they have, they have sentimental, cynical, and, and sexual. Sentimental being love means never saying sorry. Cynical says from Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? And sexual, you can, you can look at 100,000 TV shows or movies and you'll find it, unfortunately. You'll find it there. And in 1 Corinthians 13, it gives us the definition of how love is supposed to act. This is the most common chapter that's, that's spoken at weddings. It's often referred to as the love chapter. And it defines for us how love is supposed to act. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 is love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. Self-seeking. It is angered. It keeps no love to light and evil. This is with truth. It always, always tries, always hopes, perseveres. Love is a choice, not a feeling. Love is a choice, not a feeling. And I want us to take this list. So I have five points that we're going to be going through. Through this passage, I have five points. And I want us to take this list, and I want us to up against our relationships and evaluate how healthy our relationships are. Our relationships with our friends, with your kids, with your spouses, your parents. This list, this passage is a great way to keep our relationships healthy and showing love. So my first point is love is patient. Tells me that love is alive when it has time. It tells me that love is dying, hurried. It tells me if it's dead when it cannot wait. Love is patient. Love takes the time. And we spend so much of our time in the waiting room of life. We wait to get, we wait to get married. You wait to have children. You wait for illnesses to pass. You wait for dreams to happen, to happen. And we often wait together for things. And that's part of being in a relationship. But the struggle isn't with waiting, not waiting with each other. The struggle comes when we wait for each other. The struggle isn't waiting with each other. It's waiting for each other. Patience means that I make allowances for another person's faults. I make allowances for their faults. Patience means that I'm waiting with somebody, that I'm waiting, not only waiting with somebody, but waiting for somebody. Patience means that I take time to wait for someone else to change, to wait for someone else to get motivated, for, for someone else to get through the hurt. I am waiting for them. And that's a common struggle, but that's the tough part about love. And love is a choice, not a feeling. And I find strength and motivation with other people because God is patient with me. God has forgiven me again and again and again and again. He's forgiven me again and again. And I find strength in that to be patient for others because he first was patient with me. 
That's where I draw my strength, to be patient for others. And then number two, love is alive when it cares, is dying when it forgets, is dead when it ignores. Simply put, love is kind. And that, that we use that word a lot, but what does it mean? Kindness means that we have the ability to care for someone through our everyday life. We care for them through our everyday life. Kindness knows how to turn our grand vows that we make on our wedding day and turn them into washing the dishes, taking out the trash, cleaning up the house, even when it's not our responsibility. Even when it's not our turn. That's kindness. Kindness means that I have to adapt to meet the practical needs of other people. Not only our spouses, but also the people of the church. Honestly, I, I, really, I really believe that most people don't know how to show kindness in today's world. Because it wasn't properly exemplified in their own home. I believe most people don't know how to show kindness in today's world. That's why it's so important to be modeling kindness in our homes, out in public, so that we can be showing what kindness truly is. And so that you can raise your kids knowing how to be kind to other people. We have to model it. And Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you. If I'm kind towards another person, I have to be tender-hearted towards them. I have to realize that the person across from me is a person just like me. They go through struggles. They have heartaches. They go through down times. And I have to understand that they have struggles just like, just like I do. And kindness means that I take the time to forgive them. I take the time to forgive them for their faults. The only way I can have a relationship with God is because he first forgave us. And the only real way I can have a relationship with other people is by forgiving them, by forgiving each other. And I've heard some people ask, well, what if he or she doesn't deserve forgiveness? Well, I'm going to tell you something, Alive Church. Neither do we. We don't deserve forgiveness either. Jesus, God sent his son to die on the cross. He first forgave us. We didn't deserve it. But he forgave us. And this is where we can draw our strength from. This is what I'm reminded with when someone has maybe hurt me. You know, Jesus first forgave me. So who am I? Who am I to not forgive the other person? That's where we draw our strength. Love is a choice, not a feeling. And once again, kindness means I have our tender heart to forgive and to love other people. My point number three, love is alive when it is secure, when it has strength and foundation of security. It's dying when it's doubting, and it's dead when it stops tr trusting. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Behind these, behind these three words, we can put that it equals, in, that it equals insecurity. And the reason, the reason maybe I envy is maybe because I'm insecure. Maybe I don't have what the other person has. Or the reason I boast or that I'm prideful is because I'm really insecure in my own life. Security is one of the number one issues that we find in relationships. It's what makes relationships work. Security is what makes relationships work. If I want to not make a relationship, relationship work, I would add in insecurity. I would be distraught. I would, I would keep things from my partner. I would be dishonest if I wanted to bring insecurity into my relationship. So what do we have to do to do the opposite? Well, we have to tell the truth. We have to be honest with our partners. Imagine the difference it would make in somebody's life, not even just your partner, but in your friend's life, in your parents' life, that you told them that no matter what we go through, I will stand by your side. No matter the depth, no matter the darkness, no matter how ill you get, I will stand by your side because I love you. 
Imagine the difference that would make in all of our lives. And God says that to us. He says that to us. That no matter what we've been through, no matter how far we've gone, I will always love you. He loves us. Love is a choice, not a feeling. And point number four, love is alive when it's giving. It's dying when it's exchanging. And it's dead when it's taking. There are all different kinds of relationships that we have. We have give and take relationships. You give and I take. Or we have fair exchange relationships. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. But the most healthy kind of relationships are give-give relationships. They are give-give relationships. They give even though they don't have to. They may wash the dishes. They, they may clean the house. They may do this even though they don't have to. They've made the choice. It's a give-give relationship. It's their decision. We have a real dangerous part in our society of common relationships that are exchange relationships. I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. You do this, and I'll do this for you. I've seen it so many times in our society, just these give back, take and take relationships. Instead of being give, give relationships, live church, we're supposed to be giving. We're supposed to be tenderhearted. We're supposed to be forgiving of other people. Everybody is always waiting for someone to give. So what happens when someone says, oh, I, I do, I do all this, and I'm just waiting for the other person to give. They haven't given to me, so, you know, I constantly give. What do we say to that? A life church, we're always waiting on someone to give. But God didn't wait on us to give up his son. He didn't wait on us to forgive us. So life church, we need to take the first step in giving. Not even in our marriages, but also in our friendships with our parents. I don't know if anybody has ever had uh, a friend group of people and you seem to be the only person that organizes the people all the time. It's a good thing to give. It is a good thing to give. Love is a choice, not a feeling. And point number five, love is alive when it acts its way into a feeling. It's dying when it feels but doesn't act. And it's dead when it feels into an action. When it's, I just do, I feel like. Our, our actions actually impact our feelings. By the way you act, you can actually change the way that you feel. Many times people come in for counseling or for relationship, and they'll ask questions uh, that I, they'll say, I don't love him, her, my parents, my kids, my friends. What's wrong with me? What do I do? And the most common thing that we'll say to people is that you need to act like you love them. You need to act your way into a feeling. You need to act like you love them. Because here's God's advice to us in 1 Corinthians 13, 7. He says, love always protects. When I feel like a bend you and run, I will protect our love. Love always trusts. Even though I feel like hating you, I will learn to trust you. Always hopes. Even though I feel we have no future. I will hope the future with you. Love always perseveres. Even when every in my body says to run and hide, I will stand by your side. Love can act its way into a new feeling. Love is a choice, not a feeling. I'm actually going to ask Kimberly to please come up. So how do I handle a love that's dead? What do I do about it? It's dead, it's gone, it's buried. I'd say, don't give up. Don't give up. If he can resurrect Jesus from the grave, if he can re resurrect Jesus from the tomb, he can resurrect your relationship. He can resurrect your relationship. But how do we do that? We need to make the choice to act our way into a feeling, to persevere again. You may, you may, be, you may be like, oh, I don't want to trust again. I don't want to get hurt again. I don't want to trust this person again. 
But I have to say, if there's even a little bit of hope left, if there's even an incremental amount of hope left, We need to act our way into the feeling. We need to love the people that are around us. We need to make the choice. We need to make the choice because we don't want to be the people that are holding back the relationship because we choose not to forgive. We choose not to trust. We choose not to love the other person. You know, if you're here today and you say, I don't know who this Jesus person is. I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith today. Make a choice to open up your heart to love a good father who first loved you, who died on the cross just for you. Lab Church, can you please stand with me? Please bow your heads as I pray. Lord, we thank you for this choice to love every day. God, as we continue to work the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, Father, I just ask that you would multiply this seed day to go out into the world, to go out into our friendships, our marriages, our parents, with our kids, and to help us love one another to make the choice as we enter the home to put our things in order, to be in a give-give relationship, to give even though we might not be receiving. Father, to trust in you, to trust in your good nature because you first gave to us. So, Father, we trust in you this morning. Father, mold us, stretch us into everything that you have for us. Multiply the seed within our hearts this morning. God, we want to love abundantly. We don't want to love a little. We want to be an alive church. We want to be alive in